<laughs> well, I'm choosing to sit as of now. Oh, okay. you can go. Oh, you want me to start now? Whatever you want. So, today we're going to talk about the paper, Do Artifacts Have Politics? Um, for anybody who was at B-Sides a couple weeks ago, one of the presenters also covered some of the material in this, so some of it might be familiar. So, first thing is, yes, <laughs> artifacts do have politics. So when we talk about artifacts, we're talking about technologies. Uh, the definitions of technology and technologies used in the paper um, are what you see here. So technology is all of modern practical artifacts. So that's pretty much anything like um, bikes, chairs, bridges, actual like, computers, apps, phones, a little bit of everything. So um, it's not just restrict restricted to tech. Um, you also have the physical artifacts as well. And then of course technology, so smaller or larger pieces of systems of hardware of a specific kind. So again, bridges, um, things like that. So politics are arrangements of power and authority in human associations as well as the, as the activities that take place within those arrangements. So something simple like, um, I mean you guys are sitting over there, I'm standing over here, so there's a little bit of a uh, power arrangement right there. Same thing with artifacts is uh, where it's set up, who's using it, if it's a group item, if it's a single person item. There's a lot of just intrinsic ways that uh, power and authority are flowing through those interactions. So our main issue is this long bubble taken directly from the paper, saying, um, like our, our claim is that the machine structures and systems of our culture can be accurately judged not only for the contributions of efficiency and productivity, and also not merely for the positive or negative environmental side effects, but also for the ways in which they can embody specific forms of power and authority. So we're saying like, yes, um, artifacts have environmental effects. They also obviously have things that make them more efficient in our culture. For example, when we've got calculators, obviously much more helpful than always doing it in your head. Same thing with computers. When computers came in, we saw a huge surge of productivity. Um, but we also need to look at, again, how power and authority flows by using these items. So why this is important is persistence. We have so many artifacts that we've made that stay. <laughs> Um, for example, you think about chairs. Well, they're made a certain way. You expect a certain uh, design. Usually, like these ones here, you have four legs, a back, and a seat. But when fancier chairs are coming out, you have the foam backs, or the backs you can see through, or better back support, or um, rolly chairs, and things like that. And people are, at first, wary of it. So you have to think about how these are going to affect future designs. People expect that the first one there sort of persists throughout every iteration after. It's hard to get people to change their minds once they're used to something. So technologies sort of have two basic types, authoritarian technologies and democratic technologies. It's kind of weird to split it right away into politics, but um, authoritarian artifacts are system-centered. So things like nuclear power sites, um, you don't expect that to everybody have one in their backyard. You don't expect everybody to have a direct control in how they work. Instead, you kind of expect a top-down hierarchy of how people would access and change uh, nuclear power sites. And again, the reasons they're sort of system-centered is because they're very powerful. You don't want everybody handling plutonium. <laughs> It'd be kind of a bad thing. The other thing, though, is it's inherently unstable for the reason that I mean, if you think about nuclear power and it's uh, supplying electricity to a large population, as soon as it goes out, you cause huge panic. Um, it's something that, as it's a single point of failure. Whereas democratic technologies are man-centered. So in, co in contrast to nuclear power, something like solar power. Um, anybody can put solar panels on their house. They're fairly easy to implement, but it's relatively weak. You're not getting the same power output for um, you know, one solar panel to one nuclear reactor facility, but it's resourceful and durable because you have the energy um, dispersed throughout a whole bunch of different places. If, <laughs> if a, uh, a bunch of houses had solar panels and one house gets taken out of the grid, well, it's not going to be as bad as a whole nuclear site failing. 
So some technologies are inherently um, democratizing, things that help democrat democracy along, even though you wouldn't think of these as in the last slide as a uh, technology that you could classify as democratic. For example, we did just talk about nuclear power, but that was something that get, gave everybody the opportunity to have electricity, to use tools, to have that bit of safety. Um, and obviously, same thing with all the technologies here. They found new ways to get people involved in their culture and be able to see more, do more. For example, television. Um, they highlighted it in the paper as uh, power to disband armies, cash your presence, to create a whole new democratic world in ways that dem democracy never before imagined. So TV now, or for the internet, for example, you can see so many celebrities that go out for a bar night and all of a sudden it's on your TV. Um, years ago, that wouldn't have mattered. No one would have wasted resources trying to get you that information. And same thing with our political leaders now. So much of it comes through on ads, through your YouTube, through your TV, and all these different ways to garner attention from the people they're supporting. Um, you're much more aware of the issues that are happening. Um, other things come into play like I mean, everybody's super excited. Justin Trudeau is apparently gorgeous. Um, you talk to people from other countries, and they're like, yeah, your prime minister is just handsome. <laughs> and it's like, that shouldn't be one of the things you're focusing on the most. But because we have TV, it's something that might have helped him is his image. But our focus today is what is that technology itself doesn't matter, but more the social and econo economic system in which it's embedded. So. I have this picture. <laughs> I drew it myself. Um, but basically, technology feeds into social factors which feed back into technology. They kind of go hand in hand. For example, Uber. Um, a lot of people are really excited about Uber being in new, c in new cities. Uh, you can go across things quickly. You can see the cars when they come. You can uh, get a whole bunch of detail as opposed to taxis, which you call one company. They send somebody out. Likely, even if they have an app, I know the one in Winnipeg is not particularly up to date when they send you. Um, but because there's things like Uber in some cities, it's starting to change social factors. People are expecting a certain speed of service. They're expecting, uh, you know, that they might get a Ferrari, pick them up the next time, or a Lexus, or you know, a super like bulletproof SUV that was interesting once. But that's starting to change social factors because now people are um, seeing what they can get. And it's pressuring the technologies that were already there to change. So it's pressuring taxis to develop new systems, but instead they're trying to fight back. So you have this circle of things feeding into each other that's really interesting and important to keep in mind when you're developing. So the basic thing uh, so far is to take uh, technical artifacts seriously. When you're designing, you have to consider how it's going to affect your society, how it's going to affect your um, even economic factors. You have to pay attention to the characteristics of the objects and the meanings of those characteristics. Um, how does it empower people to do things? How will people use that? How is that going to affect people in the future? Um, you have to think about it in all phases that this product might take. And then we, we start to think about whether we can identify certain technologies as political phenomena in their own right. So, so far we've been discussing how they can be used and some characteristics they can have. So now we have to think about politics. So this is one instance where politics come into play with art artifacts as said in the paper. Um, so politics can come in in instances where the invention, design, or arrangement of specific technical devices or, s or systems become a way of settling an issue in a particular community. Sometimes technologies can be used to make people do something they wouldn't otherwise do. Our second option is that inherently political technologies are man-made systems that appear to require or to be strongly compatible with particular kinds of political relationships. So now I'm going to go through a couple examples. So the first one is um, New York Bridges. So we had Robert Moses, who's this guy here, looks fairly nice, doesn't look terrible. Um, but he's one of these people that had a huge effect on the architecture in New York. And part of what he did was develop bridges, skyscrapers, um, different parks, and had a huge effect on how New York developed. 
One of the things he did was develop bridges that were uh, only nine feet from the curb. So this is particularly short considering the average person is eh, about two thirds of that height or shorter. Um, but bridges or uh, buses were too tall to fit under these bridges. So it stopped a, a type of transportation from getting to a certain spot. This spot was actually uh, one of Robert Moses's, uh, I think, favorite parks or actual, it might have been his park. But at the time, the only people that took buses were black people or people who were very poor. And so by having these bridges be too short for buses to get underneath, it actually restricted a whole population from accessing this park. So you can see the bridge itself wasn't political in its own right, but he used it for political games, which is our first option there, that you know, people can use it to settle a dispute. His dispute is one that he solved before it even happened, which, rude. <laughs> Um, and then we have university campuses. So this one might be familiar to some. It's University of Manitoba. But as you see, the building is cement. It's large. It's bulky. There's nothing pretty about it. It is just ugly. <laughs> um, but part of the reason for this sort of architecture was so students would hold demonstrations on campus. Apparently, just the architecture itself was so um, depressing that they hoped that people wouldn't have any sort of riots or anything. So this sort of architecture became very, very popular across many campuses. Um, if you ever visit other universities or have an oppor opportunity to even see University of Winnipeg downtown, you'll see a lot of just square um, buildings. Question? And to add in, this is specifically date-wise, this is 1960s architecture. Yeah, so most of his architecture did come out in the 60s, 70s. It is the main focus in the paper, because I think this paper is 1978. Yeah, so just after that. The paper talks about how there was actually a lot of campus riots and university like, mm -hmm. demonstrations at that time, so it was actually a huge consideration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. But yeah, again, this is using a type of artifact to change a political uh, scenario before it even happens. And we have an example of pneumatic molding machines. So this is something that would uh, create items. And there's one guy that basically had a union starting up in his shop. And he was really upset about this because uh, unions would mean they have to change how the shop work, um, make sure wages were a certain amount, same thing unions do now. But the union was still trying to solidify. So what this guy did was he bought a bunch of pneumatic molding machines up to $500,000, and even this paper was written in 1978, so again, $500,000 was much, much more than it is now. Um, but what happened is he brought all these machines in, and as I said, well, there's not enough jobs to go around anymore, so much you're just fired before the union even had a chance to start up. So what was left was a bunch of underskilled workers using the machines, and he only used them for three years. And the quality was terrible. The unskilled laborers didn't know exactly what they were supposed to be doing. So it ended up leaving. Um, the union was gone. They got rid of the machines three later, and three years later, and they're back to usual operations. So from a business standpoint, that's weird. That's a lot of money to give up and just not use in three years. Like that's just huge expenses that you're not recouping. But again, if this choice only made sense in the environment that we're looking at, the social and economic, trying to get the, uh, make sure the union can happen. So while we showed a bunch of examples that uh, people use technology for bad, we other have also have, er, have to remember, it is neither correct nor insightful to say someone intended to do someone else harm. Rather, one must say that the technological deck has been stacked long in advance to favor certain social interests and that some people were bound to receive a better hand than others. So um, one good example is handicap access. This was something that people didn't consider for a long time. But because there were stairs everywhere, no ramps, no elevators, it just excluded this whole group of people um, without even trying to hurt them. So like the examples previous, there was a definite goal. Not having handicap access was never a goal. So it's important just to keep things in perspective. 
Um, another one of our example is tomato harvesters. So there was a university in California that was surrounded by tomato farmers. Lots and lots of them. Lots of little farmers, bigger, uh, bigger farmers. But they developed this tomato harvester. So as you can see, the tomatoes are growing extremely close. Um, there's not a lot of ways to get in there besides actually by hand or this large machine because you can see everything is split out into rows. So what happened is all of a sudden um, bigger farmers started to get favored because they could use these tomato harvesters. They could go in, they could scoop everything up and just be done. Um, but the decision to use this all of a sudden made the smaller farmers not as profitable because they couldn't turn out the same volume, they couldn't uh, have the same effect on their land because they had to grow it further apart so they could actually go in and do it by hand, get uh, use other smaller machinery as opposed to this. So it put these, these smaller farmers at a greater disadvantage more quickly. So this, again, wasn't a specific choice to hurt somebody or harm somebody, it just all of a sudden making a choice made a huge difference. So specifically, we have this crucial decision when we look at a technology. Are we going to use it? Yes or no. This happens a lot when uh, technology is new, when it hasn't been used before, when we don't have any precedent for what it might change. Um, yeah, so once we choose yes or no, we have a range of choices. Once you decide to put something in, you can decide whether what the specific features are in the design or an arrangement of a technical system, and then after the decision to go ahead, or after the decision to go ahead has already been made. So it's like when you're making a new uh, app, for example, you'll decide why you want it, but you don't know how you're going to do it or who's going to benefit from it the most. So then you have to start making these choices to see who you're going to satisfy. So other more physical examples are power lines, um, machinery, transit systems, water projects. Um, like for example, for us, the transit system has been huge. Everybody's like, yeah, rapid transit, but they can't agree where or how or how much money. <laughs> and so as soon as they say yes, though, and get this idea, they have to find a way to make it work. Um, that was actually a big thing in our last mayor mayoral election is yes, rapid transit, but no one still said, said how. So these are choices that need to be made. So the impact of choosing yes or no and then choosing from the range of choices is that the greatest latitude of choice exists the very first time a particular instrument, system, or technique is introduced. Um, so this is something like with the internet right now and people trying to censor it or trying to charge different rates for um, different people getting priority, we have to fight now so these issues don't come up later, that we aren't fighting this down the road. We can just stop people trying to change how it works now. So because choices tend to become strongly fixed in material equipment, economic investment, and social habit, the original flexibility will vanish for all particular purposes once the initial commitments are made. Once you make that first draft, first idea, it's very difficult to root somebody out, um, <coughs> like we were discussing the chairs earlier. So when we look at particular art, political artifacts, we have to examine and evaluate certain kinds of technology and whether they allow flexibility. This will give us a better idea of whether an item is inherently political. Because if it is, if it is inherently political, it won't have that flexibility because there's only one way to really use it. It's um, basically a counterexample. You can't counterexample where this artifact wouldn't be used politically. So if it doesn't have this flexibility, well, when we look at flexibility, it is then that we can understand that choosing certain technologies also chooses a particular form of political life. So back to authoritarian systems. So some systems are inherently authoritarian. This is because they only move at a certain speed and they create a rigid structure. For example, when you're doing a monotonous task. Um, for example, working in a tax department, you might have to scan the checks, put the checks in the system, have somebody double check the check, have somebody write that in, have somebody update uh, the account, and so on. And because there's so many steps that must be done in a particular order, it makes people act in a certain way, they have specific tasks, and then you get that hierarchical, hierarchical uh, structure happen. 
So this is something to think about. It's the same thing with transportation. You can only move things so fast. You can only have things go in a certain direction. Um, so this becomes supply chain management, and that sort of becomes authoritarian. So once we understand that sort of thing, we can look at internal versus external factors when we're looking at the politics. So internal factors that change the politics are concerned with the workings of an industry, workplace, or technology. Um, often when people have a job, there's a certain way things are done in that job, whether it's coding standards, who has lunch, who get or who has lunch when, <laughs> not the lunch. Um, when you get to show up, how early you get to leave, what dress code you wear, so that sort of things. These internal factors don't necessarily represent or affect the surrounding society as a whole. It's not often that one workplace doing one specific thing will affect the other workplaces nearby by ha having like a wear funny colors day. It's not going to have a bigger effect elsewhere. And then external factors are concerned whether the technology fits in the society it's been designed for. So again, this is like looking at solar panels. Do solar panels fit with what we're trying to achieve? Um, so trying to make sure we have sustainable energy, that sort of thing. Um, so the reasoning between a bunch of these factors that people take into consideration are economic cost and benefits. Is it worth it to put this extra effort in to get this result? Um, environmental impacts. Do we want to do extra processing to make sure this doesn't affect other people? Um, and public health and safety. So obviously public health and safety um, are a little more concerned with external factors. Uh, so public health, for example, um, if your business is um, is a bar, for example, and there's a lot of people around, you probably want to make sure that there's proper cameras, that there's safety, that you offer people uh, like DDs to get home, and that sort of thing. So one example of internal and external factors and its effect on authoritarian versus dem uh, democratic technologies is ships. So part of this is, when you think of a ship, you think of a captain, you think of a first mate, I mean, we've all seen enough pirate movies, you can probably you know, extrapolate from there. But the question is, is this a democratic or authoritarian structure? Well, because you think of a captain and a first mate, all of a sudden you've ha you have a hierarchy there. You probably think it's authoritarian, and the question kind of comes up, is could a ship run in a democratic way? Is there a way that everybody could have an equal say in how a ship is run? So that's just more of a thought point for later. Same thing with solar energy. We talked about this being sort of a democratic technology because it can be dispersed through people. It can be done, um, you know, one person, one house, other person, another house. But there's also opportunities for sol solar energy farms where there's just large, large structures of these panels all laid out in open space. Well, is that democratic or is that authoritarian? Um, how does this technology kind of promote one way or the other? And the atom bomb. <laughs> this is kind of um, authoritarian as well, you'd assume from the beginning. Because again, as we talked earlier, um, you've got a lot of really intense chemicals that you're dealing with, things that you might not want the average person to use. So can this be used in a democratic manner? Do we, do we want this used in a democratic manner? Or does this actually push people into certain political structures? So this is one that I would argue is <laughs> There's a certain kind of political atmosphere that comes with having a bomb. Um, and it's something to consider when we ask, do artifacts have politics? And same thing with nuclear power plants. Again, do you want everybody having an equal say in the safety measures, security measures, and all the uh, other policies used within a nuclear power plant? So sort of some of the side effects of either having an authoritarian or democratic technology is infringement of protected rights. As soon as you consider a nuclear um, test site or uh, power plant, you have to think, well, what happens if it's democratic and somebody steals all, all the nuclear waste? I mean, that's a really, really big problem. Um, what would you do to get it back? Would you lie to people? Would you spy, to, spy on people? Obviously, you couldn't have this not uh, nuclear waste go without being found. 
So it's sort of at that point that people will start to tread on others. So does that create, again, how does that change the environment? Does it affect whether it's democratic or authoritarian? How would you react to that situation? And the other thing to think about is when you're trying to develop these technologies is whether the issues are hypothetical or real. Um, because there's instances where you're like, well, that might happen, this might happen, but, and you make all these plans, but what would you actually do when it does actually happen? Um, what, would, what would change about how you approach the situation? Um, for example, urgency and that sort of thing can change it from democratic to authoritarian pretty fast. For example, when um, a ship crashes and you end up on an island, you might get something like Lord of the Flies, um, not necessarily the best outcome. And also while we're looking at uh, technologies, we have to consider that social life adapts to technical requirements. Um, cell phones are so pervasive now that you probably, well most people probably can't imagine not having a cell phone or not using it frequently. It's something that social life has started to change around that technology. Uh, people expect instant responses. Um, you have so many event in invitations, it's hard to turn everything off and not be reachable unless like, you're actually, actually trying. So social life changes based on how you develop and use technologies. So I'm going to help you again. Yeah, I only did help <laughs> um, So conclusions to take from this paper are that specific features in the design or, or arrangement of a device or system can drastically change the politics involving it. Your initial choice choice is going to set things sort of to start from there, that you're going to have to work with that base repeatedly. So as you develop technologies and you consider it to be unique enough, try to consider how this is going to affect people in the future as well as now. And flexibility. Um, try and work flexibility into your items unless you're, well I guess the point is, is trying to get a certain type of political atmosphere, don't make it flexible. And intrinsic characteristics of the technology are also important. So last slide, uh, technical devices and systems are important in everyday life. They contain possibilities for many different ways of ordering human activity. So one technology in one place will not affect people in a different place in the same way. Um, and it's important to consider that this technology might be used elsewhere. It might be used in different scenarios. Um, and then technologies are a way of building order in our world. So it's a new way. You can use technologies to change the world around you. You can, so it's, yeah, I'm done. Okay, questions? <laughs>